Hello and welcome everybody. In this video we will cover section 2.3 of the book, which is about Markov chains. And we are covering this topic because later we will use Markov chains as part of Markov chain Monte Carlo estimates. And Markov chains are just the basic building block of this method, so we will need to establish some basics of Markov chains. If you have learned about Markov chains before, everything in these three videos will be very basic to you, but I would suggest that you still give it a quick run through. And if you're new to Markov chains, don't worry, we will only need the very basics and everything we need will be covered in section 2.3. So you can do it just based on the book. So let's jump straight in. I will give a very short introduction to Markov chains so that we are all on the same level as far as Markov chains are concerned when we are going to use these for Markov chain Monte Carlo estimates in the next chapter. So for now, no Monte Carlo estimates. This section we just focus on Markov chains and then later we see how we can use them. So let's start with the definition. The formal definition of a Markov chain says a stochastic process xt where t is in the positive integers with values xt and s is called a Markov chain if the following condition holds, namely if x t plus 1 in a t plus 1 given x t equals little a t up to x 0 equals little a 0 equals the conditional probability of x t plus 1 in a t plus 1, that's the same event, but now only given the condition x t equals a t. So if this condition holds for all a0 up to a t in s, a t plus 1 subset of s, and all t element n. And let's just see, I made a small mistake. t starts at 0, so I need to write n0 up here. Good, so let's go with this definition bit by bit. So first, a stochastic process, that is something which depends on randomness and on time. So here t is the time, and time goes in steps for the Markov chain, so t can be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on, that's n0. And I said it depends on time and on randomness, so xt is the time taken out, that's the value of x at time t, but there it's still random, xt for every t is a random variable. We'll see examples in a minute. Then there is the set S, where xt takes its values. In our examples, that will normally just be numbers. So then we would write R. But the definition works for general state space, so that could be any set in theory. Then, so far we have just defined stochastic process with state space S. And this stochastic process is a Markov chain, if the condition down here holds. And where the interpretation of t as time is important, namely xt plus 1 is what happens one step into the future. And we ask, what does this do conditioned on the past? So we condition on what happened at time 0 up to time t. And then we ask here, condition what we have just seen, what is the behavior of xt plus 1? And for random variables, to ask about the behavior, the traditional way is to ask what the probability of it being in a set. So that's how this is written. And the second probability, which we are asking to be equal to the first one, that looks quite similar, only here we just condition on the last step before t plus 1. So here we condition on time t, and here we condition on all times from 0 to t. And the process is a Markov chain if for the behavior it doesn't matter what happened further in the past, and the behavior of the next step is completely described by what happened just before, so what happened at time t. That's what these two lines say, and these are really the core of the whole definition. And then the quantifiers down here just say that needs to hold whatever has happened in the past, and that needs to be true for every question we could ask about xt plus 1, so every set we can plug in here, and it needs to hold for all time. So that is the definition of a Markov chain, and I didn't write that, but we can add this here with state space s, s is where it takes values. Good, so that's the definition we have to understand in this section. So the first thing I want to do, I want to give an example. The process I want to consider here is called the random walk. And this is a Markov chain which is made up as a sum of individual independent random variables. So let's start with these. So let epsilon n, n in n be a 
sequence of independent and identically distributed random variables. And the Markov chain is defined as sum i from 1 to n epsilon i for all n in n. And I want to define x0 separately. That is 0. One could argue that that is a special case of the sum, but then one would need to explain what the sum from 1 to 0, which I would say is the empty sum, so it would be 0. But let's write it separately just to be sure. And this process, I claim, is a Markov chain. So then xn, n in n0 is a Markov chain. And in this section from now on, I'm going to write mc instead of Markov chain, just because it's shorter. So let's just have a look. Why is this true? We need to check that knowing the past beyond the previous step does not change the distribution of the next step. So that is what the definition says. So we need to check knowing xn is all we need to know to understand the distribution of xn plus 1. And that is quite easy, namely xn plus 1 equals sum i from 1 to n plus 1 epsilon i. And I want to split that into sum i from 1 to n epsilon i plus the last one. And that, using the definition, is xn plus epsilon n plus 1. And we can see that these two terms are independent because the epsilon n are independent. That's what this i here stands for. That here is made up of the first n epsilon, where that is the n plus first. So that and that must be independent just because the epsilon are independent. And from this we see, from this independence, nothing of the internal structure here affects the distribution of this. What xn plus 1 does, if we know xn is just given by what the distribution of epsilon n plus 1, it is clear from that that x must be a Markov chain because that probability where we condition on knowing the whole past will equal, in this case, the probability for the next step where we just know xn. Good. So that's one example. Then let's do an example of a process which is not a Markov chain that, as before, epsilon n, n in n, be iid. I write it a bit shorter. That still means a sequence of independent and identically distributed random variable. And x0 is 0, x1 is 0, and xn is xn minus 1 plus xn minus 2 over 2 plus epsilon n for all n starting at 2. Then here you can directly see in the definition of xn there is not only the previous step but there is also the step before. So in this case it is easy to imagine that that may not be a Markov chain. Let me just write what we get for the next step. xn plus 1 equals 1 half xn plus 1 half xn minus 1 plus epsilon n plus 1. And because of this term here, it makes a difference what value xn minus 1 had. So if we know that, that tells us something about xn plus 1. And then one can show, I'm not going to do that in detail, that that process is in fact not a Markov chain. Great. That hopefully gives you a bit of a sense of what this Markov property means. So again, it means for knowing the behavior of the next step, Knowing this step just before is enough. And if you know what happens further down the line before times t, that will not make any difference. It will not affect what does the next step do. So that's called the Markov property. And with this in place, we can now start studying basic properties of Markov chains. And we'll start doing that in the next section. So see you then.